Hello everyone, this is Lori Anderson, host for Resurrect the Republic RTR Truth Radio Broadcast. This is a rebroadcast of the April 11, 2017 show with myself, as well as Eric Hughes Jones of courtroomwatch.org, covering the congressional hearings on the Committee to Review Law Enforcement Policies on Facial Recognition Technology. This is an important show. I don't feel like you want to miss it. It's extremely important that you know this information. I hope you enjoy the show. Yes, welcome to the show. I noticed the recording just started, so you're, you're listening to the radio call uh, for Courtroom Watch. Uh, I'm Eric Hughes-Jones, Eric the Freedom Screamer, along with my co-host, Lori Anderson. She's actually going to be pretty much in charge tonight. So anyway, welcome everybody to this call. We're working on it. We're working out technical difficulties for this broadcast, uh, but we're going to be building here not only this platform, but also studio1776.org and all the people at Single Parents Helping Single Parents. We want to welcome you as well. Um, we do we do focus on a wide variety of things um, that have a lot to do with parenting. How about education being number one? And since the education system isn't working very well, or let me let me rephrase that, the education system is working very well to create dumbed down, uh, obedient, uh, non thinking, non critically thinking uh, uh, drones, so to speak, human drones, human resources. Why do they call us a human resource? Why don't they call us human beings? because they're trying to diminish people to the status of a worker bee, a slave, more or less an animal. And if you read the Food Safety Act of 19, it's either 1903 or 1906, it says humans and other animals. Did you get that word other? That means the government is already very comfortable classifying all of us as animals. It's not right. And we try to uh, bring an awakening here through knowledge and education. And, of course, activism you're not going to get much activism from the other broadcasts, so we're not afraid to name names, help people through their court cases, uh, especially you know in the courts, because that's where the power is. We do not have three separate equal branches of government. All the power rests in the courts. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it back to Lori. She's got a power-packed show full tonight. So we're going to go over the uh, – well, I'll let, I'll let Lori describe what we're going to do. I'm going to go on mute and turn it over to Lori, our world-class reporter. Uh, Lori can be found at Lori Anderson Google+. Plus. That's Lori, L-O-R-R-I. Lori with two R's, last name Anderson, Google+. Plus. Also, uh, my stuff and our stuff together is at courtroomwatch.com. Also, we'll be very in the very near future building an online platform at studio1776.org. Thank you to everybody who's going to join us tonight. And, Lori, I'll turn it back over to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Eric. And also, you can find a lot of my articles at freedomoutpost.com as well. And uh, so what we're going to discuss tonight on... March the 22nd, 2017, the Oversight and Government Reform Committee held a hearing, and this hearing was um, to review law enforcement's policy on facial recognition, recognition technology. I have not heard about uh, anything in the mainstream or lamestream media, if you will, and nor have I heard it spoken about too much in alternative media. If they have, I haven't heard of it. So this was some of the takeaways, and then I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. Approximately half of the adult Americans' photographs are in what is called an FRT database. Eighteen states have what is known as a Memorandum of Understanding or an MOU with the FBI to share photos with the federal government, including from state departments and motor vehicles. The committee identified Maryland and Arizona as having MOUs with the FBI, but there is much more, which we will get into in just a little while. The FBI also used facial recognition technology, or the FRT, for years without first publishing a privacy impact assessment as required by law. FRT has accuracy def deficiencies, misidentifying female and African American individuals at a higher rate. Human verification is often insufficient as a backup and can allow for racial bias. The FBI went to great lengths to attempt and exempt itself from certain provisions of the Privacy Act. So the purpose of their hearing was to review the current state of the FRT, its various uses, benefits, and challenges, and to evaluate if the legislation is necessary. To examine the FBI's use of the FRT and the FBI policies that govern the recording, retention, and use of photographs by law enforcement. So a little bit of the background. The background is the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law estimated 
that when accounting for all the databases that the law enforcement has access to, nearly one in two Americans is in this facial recognition database. FBI's next generation identification system includes an interstate photo system that allows the FBI and selected state and local law enforcement to search a database of over 300 million photos. The FBI also has agreements with at least 17 states that allow it to request a FRT search of state driver's license databases. A government accountability office report found that the FBI should better should better ensure privacy and accuracy in its use of the FRT. The executive director from Georgetown Law, he provided a document and it was very interesting what he said in there. So I will tell you that um, it was found out during this hearing that the FBI, it's not for people who have a warrant, it's not a quote unquote criminal database, they're using people and scanning faces of people who absolutely do not even have any reason to be suspected of a crime. There is no warrant, no probable cause warrant. That was um, that was exposed by uh, Mr. Jim Jordan and uh, Mr. Chaffetz also uh, went really hot and heavy on that. The individual from Mr. Bedoya from Georgetown Law goes into great detail, which I will read to you in just a moment. And even um, when Mr. Chaffetz was questioning the FBI, because the FBI was trying to make it seem as if this was a good thing, oh no, we don't collect the data on all these Americans, um, and they were exposed as liars by uh, individuals like Ms. Lynch from the EFF, um, and as well as Georgetown Law and other witnesses that were there. And what had happened was they had tried to, you know, well, technically they don't have it in their database, so we don't quote unquote have it. Well, you know how that goes. Just because you don't have it, if you've got it in access and you've got it in retention, you have it. And we do not want that. It was also exposed that they have access to over 412 million images from non-criminal individuals. So this also goes into another aspect that we have to look at because there are 18 states that have a um, the MOU in agreement uh, to be able to search these state driver's license databases and they don't even have a probable cause warrant so therefore there is a violation of course of your fourth amendment so what I'm going to do right now let me get to that report from Mr. Bedoya. This is his statement and I'm just going to read his statement because I am unable to play his audio. It says, face recognition technology lets law enforcement scan people's faces and identify them from far away and in secret. This brings real benefits for public safety. Without adequate oversight, however, it creates real threats to privacy, civil liberties, and civil rights. Even though most American adults are enrolled in a criminal face recognition network, this technology is largely unregulated. No federal law controls it. No court case limits it. A few agencies in places like California, Michigan, and Washington have meaningful checks and against misuse. In most cases, this technology is not under control. In 2015, the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law began a year-long evaluation of privacy, civil liberties, and civil rights protections in the face recognition systems used by the FBI and police across the nation. We submitted more than 100 records requests and received 16,000 pages of responses from 90 agencies. In October, we published our findings in the perpetual lineup, Unregulated Police Face Recognition in America, a 150-page report available at perpetuallineup.org backslash report. A few key takeaways are below. One in two adults are in a criminal face recognition network. You heard that correct. One in two adults. 
or in a criminal face recognition network. At least 29 states allow criminal face recognition services searches of driver's license photos. Over 125 million adults, 51%, are in a criminal face recognition network. The FBI can request searches in at least 17 states. Never before, not with fingerprints nor DNA, has law enforcement created a national biometric network made up of mostly innocent people. So this is, these, before I continue reading his testimony, let's make this clear. They're trying to claim that there's no regulations that control it. Oh, yes, it is. It's called the Fourth Amendment. They just don't follow it. Let's also make something else very clear. They're doing this on people who are innocent, not suspected of a crime, and they are creating that database. Law-abiding people may be subject to face recognition searches. No warrants are required for searches of driver's license or other photos. Now, before I continue, I want to say this. That also not only gives them the face, it gives them your address, it gives them all of that information, and no one with the previous database release where they got hacked with the OPM database issue that I had covered previously on one of the uh, other radio shows, that is a real concern because um, social security numbers, fingerprints, um, retina scans, all of that, family, family histories, uh, addresses, everything was released in that hack. So continuing, most agencies, including the FBI, do not require officers to reasonably suspect someone of a crime before using face recognition ID to ID them. Six major agencies have bought or are exploring real-time face recognition on live video. This technology can scan the face of every man, woman, or child who passes in front of a street camera. Eventually, this technology could be used to scan every face that passes by a police body-worn camera, and it is unclear if the FBI is exploring or using real-time face recognition. Agencies are not taking steps to protect free speech. It appears that face recognition has been used to ID people attending protests. Yes, we can confirm that. An FBI presentation suggests the use of face recognition at political rallies. While the Privacy Act would bar the FBI from using this technology to track political speech, the FBI recently moved to exempt itself from lawsuits for violations of that provision. Of the dozens of agencies we surveyed, only one in Ohio clearly restricted face scans at protests. Face recognition makes mistakes. It may make more mistakes for searches of African Americans and women. When it was implemented, roughly one in seven searches of the FBI system returned a list of entirely innocent candidates. FBI co-authored research suggests that face recognition may be less accurate on African Americans and women. In October, a coalition of 52 civil rights and civil liberties groups asked the Department of Justice to investigate racial bias in the face recognition. Agencies are keeping critical information from the public. After consistently failing to comply with mandatory transparency laws, the FBI proposed to exempt its system from Privacy Act provisions on public access and judicial review. Of police agencies, we surveyed less than 10% had a public policy explaining how they used face recognition. Only one agency submitted its policy for legislative approval. Major face recognition systems, including the FBI's, are not regularly audited for misuse. Only 17% of the agencies surveyed indicated that they logged and audited officers' face recognition searches for misuse. The one in Michigan provided documentation of a functional audit regime. The Government Accountability Office found that in the first 4.5 years of operation, the FBI never audited its use of the face, facial recognition. Since the 1968 passage of the Wiretap Act, Congress has passed laws that allow law enforcement to use advanced technology to investigate crime while simultaneously protecting Americans' basic freedoms. The debate before this committee is not whether to ban law enforcement face recognition or allow it. 
Instead, the question before us is how to create a system of checks and balances that lets us reap the law enforcement benefits of face recognition while also protecting American liberty. Okay, does anyone have any um, questions that about what I was just speaking about or comments? Oops. Okay. Make complete sense, but it is scary. It is scary, and it gets even worse. Um, so, the second part, what I'm going to do, if nobody has any questions or anything, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody again so that there's not a reverb uh, or whatever the case may be on that. Um, and I apologize, it, it takes me just a little bit because. <laughs> I'm I'm new to working this board. You're doing great, Lori. Appreciate it. Well, why don't you chime in while I'm doing the muting um, on yeah. a little bit about that, and then I can go into the next phase of his testimony. That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, what what happened to the Fourth Amendment? I mean, we have this is the Constitution sucks in a lot of ways, but you know, at least it's it's got some kind of fundamental structure that you know, the Bill of Rights at least give us, you know, some protection against uh, unwarranted searches of our personal effects. And, uh, you know, whatever it is, your data, whether it's your mail, your bank account, your face. I mean, you see, if, if nothing, there's not too much more of a personal effect than your own flesh on your face. <laughs> so, I mean, this is a fundamental Fourth Amendment issue. Of course, the, the, the people in government don't want to hear anything about the Constitution, even though every single one of them, took an oath to uphold it, which is the bizarre and fascinating thing to me. So I always like to lead off any proceedings in court with, uh, uh, I hold you to your oath, Judge, under Article 6, to uphold the Constitution. And they, they, kind, of, they kind of enjoy it when you hold them to that oath. So, um, Not only that, again, I mean, it's even already in statutory code with 18 U.S. Code 241 and 18 U.S. Code 242. And what sure. drove me crazy... Okay, Eric, before I go any further in, the, in, in this testimony, what drove me crazy, each one of these individuals that were exposing that was a danger and they need rules and they need um, regulations for them being able to use this, what drove me crazy about it is they absolutely already have those rules and regulations. They don't need to make new ones. We already have them. It's called the Fourth Amendment. Get a warrant. If you can, and, and what is exposed in this hearing is so egregious because what they are doing is not only is it, is it not coming back with accuracy, but these are for investigative leads. So these are just for leads. These are not even something that can be used for so, anything solid. And, the, and on top of that, a lot of them are coming back not accurate. So it, it's flipping it to the point of where you're, of course, guilty until proven innocent and proving that you're not who they say you are because some algorithm picked you up. And what they were exposing in the congressional hearing was not only that, uh, Representative Chaffetz, Chaffetz he, he asked the FBI, do you have plans to match your database with social media? Because she had already tried to sugarcoat it saying that they didn't have any non-criminal photos in their database. Well, what she was doing was she was trying to kind of get around that because what was happening is, oh, they've got access to all of it. They just don't keep it right there. Then they admitted that they've got civilian photos in their repository, but of course she tried to tell Congress, well, but we can't touch that. We can't touch those photos that are in it. Then why are they in your repository in the first place if you can't touch them? You see, so it's just another cat and mouse game. But what bothered me, and a lot of these individual representatives, they did really good at exposing what was going on. Uh, you could tell that they were really, really heated, which was good. But the other problem on that is, why aren't they saying, stop, we already have rule of law that covers that. It's called the Fourth Amendment. And if you can't stop what you're doing, then we'll just defund you, period. I mean, that's really the way it should have been handled. So by trying to look at a way to try to make it work tells me that it's a dog and pony show. They don't really mean to get rid of it. And um, 
it's it was it's a really mind blowing. It's worth two and a half hours of your time to listen to this. Um, to listen to this. So I am going to try once again, Eric. If you would chime in, I'm going to try to call on the phone to try to get it to where y'all can hear some of that hearing, um, because I just really feel it's that important for you to be able to hear what I'm talking about. And I'll do that right after I finish with the with what um, the written testimony was. Does that sound no. good? Yeah, sounds good. Give it a shot, Lori. Give it a try. I think just the old school method of letting it play over uh, over your speakerphone is going to work fine. You may just want to mute your headset microphone so it's not feeding back, looping through the phone back to your headset. But do what you have to do to try to play that, and just uh, hit the play hit hit the hit the play button on your uh, computer, and then uh, set your phone next to it. I've done it in the past on a live radio broadcast, and amazingly enough, it worked out pretty well. So it's the old school technology here tonight, folks. But might as well get prepared for it. Because well, what happens when all your what happens when all the favorite media outlets go down? I mean, that's going to happen. They've already blocked. They're doing it slowly because if they do it hard and fast, people are going to get really freaked out. But I'll tell you right now, uh, Facebook has blocked access to. This is only through Facebook. Obviously, they're not. They can't block the website quite yet, but I'm sure they're working on it. That's their next step. But for now, if you're on Facebook and you try to get to the Studio 1776 Facebook page, it's blocked by Facebook, and it's blocked. Oh, there it is. All right, Lori's working on it. I'm getting, I'm, so, I'm getting there, trying. Yeah, this is great. Cool. So, you know, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's just a conspiracy against patriots. And don't forget who's behind all of this. It's Deutsche Telekom, which is blocking not only telephone service, but my contention is, of course, if you can block access over by the phone, it's not too much of a stretch to block people's access, you know, things online at the computer. Well, Facebook, once again, is already blocking Studio 1776. So, I mean, it's pretty stupid on their part because all people are going to do is log out of Facebook and go straight to the website and see what all the big fuss is about. And Facebook isn't doing it. They're not hiding. They're they're saying, you know, they're they're when you go on the uh, the Facebook and try to get to Studio 1776, it says this site is blocked uh, due to, I think it said uh, malicious, malicious. This con, this this site has malice <laughs> and maybe be, may be dangerous, <laughs> dangerous to we know who, which is the Rothschild banking establishment and the Vicar Generals. Um, not too many people really like me talking about the vicars and the Freemasons, and it seems like whenever I get a gig, um, whether it's the NLA or RBN, uh, they seem to put me out to pasture pretty quick when I start pulling the curtain back and letting people know, hey, this is your real shadow government here. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's, it goes back to the Vatican, the banking establishment in London, and uh, you know, whether you want to call them Zionist bankers or whatever. They all have a globalist agenda. It's not friendly to our freedom. So, Lori, how are you making out there? Any success yet? Okay, I'm going. I'm going to try. If you hear it right now, this is Mr. Chaffetz, and it will also be Mr. Chaffetz, which is the chairman of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, and then Jim Jordan. Committee on Oversight and Government, Re Government Reform will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any, any time. We have an important hearing today about law enforcement's use of facial recognition technology. Uh, it's an exciting technology. Uh, the world of technology uh, offers us a lot of opportunities, but just because we can doesn't mean we necessarily should. And so there are a number of things that we need to have discussions about um, and try to figure out and tackle as a, as a society. And this is uh, one in a series of things that we're going to be discussing uh, uh, in the, this year and next uh, as uh, technology brings us to new frontiers and new paths and new things that we need to, to dive into and, and look at. Because again, while there's a lot of excitement and a lot of opportunity, there's also opportunities to have it misused or overused or create a whole other set of problems that maybe our nation and our society and our generation have not yet dealt with. This happens to be uh, one of those uh, types of, of technologies. 
facial tech, uh, recognition technology. It is, it is exciting what can be done. Um, but we have to, uh, to look at how, how this affects law enforcement and our rights as Americans, um, sus particularly suspicionless Americans uh, and our right for privacy. You know, the, the days of uh, the old Sherlock Holmes uh, dusting for fingerprints and looking for clues, uh, they're being replaced by algorithms and software scanning millions of e images at unprecedented speeds to match a, a face to a, to a name. However, like many technologies used in the wrong hands or without appropriate parameters, it is ripe for abuse. Therefore, the oversight of the use of this technology is essential. Until recently, fingerprint analysis was the most widely used biometric technology for positively identifying arrestees and linking them to previous criminal history. In 2010, the FBI began replacing its legacy fingerprint, fingerprint database with an updated database that incorporates advancements in biometrics such as facial recognition called the, called the Next Generation Identification, or NGI. This is a database uh, with an estimated cost of $1.2 billion. The FBI claims the NGI system, quote, brought the FBI's biometric identification system and criminal history information into the next, to the next level, end quote. Unfortunately, the FBI failed, failed to fulfill its statutory duty to inform the public of this new next level capability and used facial recognition technology for five years without publishing the required privacy impact assessment as required by law. Further, agreements are in place with 18 states that allow the FBI to request those states search their databases, including driver's license databases using facial recognition technology. And if we have a graphic, let me have them put that up here if we could. Uh, just to give you um, those uh, states in the, in the dark blue are the ones that have various types of relationships uh, with the FBI. Those in the light blue do not have those types of relationships. Um, but you can kind of get a sense of where the nation is going and how states are entering into these uh, memorandums of understanding. You can take the, take the graphic down. To be clear, this is a database or a network of databases comprised primarily of law-abiding Americans. Eighty percent of the photos in the FBI's facial recognition network are of non-criminal entries. Each of the photos from driver's licenses, uh, they come from places like uh, driver's licenses, passports, and, and what, what not. It would be one thing if facial re recognition technology were perfect or near perfect, but it clearly is not. Facial recognition technology does make mistakes. For example, in a test the FBI conducted prior to deploying NGI, roughly one in seven searches of the FBI system returned a list of entirely innocent candidates, even though the actual target was, actu was in the database. I also have concerns about studies suggesting facial recognition technology may have been Unintended, uh, have an unintended racial, gender, or age bias or deficiencies. Any technology biases or weaknesses correlating to race, gender, and age raise some serious concerns and need to be widely known and contemplated by law enforcement, legislative bodies, and the judiciary. Facial recognition technology is a powerful tool for law enforcement that can be used to protect people, their property, our borders, and our nation. The private sector may use technology to control access to sensitive information, protect financial transactions, verify time and attendance, and prevent uh, fraud or identity theft, among other uses. But it can also be used by bad actors to harass or stalk individuals. It can be used in a way that chills free speech and free association by targeting people attending certain political meetings, protests, churches, or other types of, of uh, places in the public. Perhaps most concerning is the prospect of its real-time use to track people's location throughout the day, a potential use that would fundamentally change what it means to live in a free society. For those reasons and others, we must conduct proper oversight of this emerging technology. I appreciate the witnesses and uh, what, what they bring here. One of the things that we're going to also talk about today is what does it mean when you populate the database, if the FBI could have its way, and the best I can understand, they would put everybody's face in one database, or a whole series of databases. 
And so well, what does that mean? I guess if it's in a secure lockbox that nobody else can look at except the FBI, some people would argue that's a good thing. But we've seen the FBI most recently can't even keep the 702 information uh, private and secure. I don't trust the federal government. I don't believe that there is such a thing where they can keep all of this information uh, locked down and secure. Does anybody really trust and believe that they can create this massive database? Imagine how valuable that database is going to be if they had a, the facial recognition of every single American in their system. And then you could just go online and you could start figuring out exactly who's walking in your door. Um, some companies are actually using this type of technology. They know who you are before you walk in the door. Um, and what does that mean if this information were to get into the wrong hands? So it poses a number of, of issues and challenges. I and I'll be real brief. I, I just wanted to thank you for uh, this hearing and your continued focus on privacy, particularly in this digital age, which we find ourselves um, a part of, and announced to the committee that uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be working with, uh, on a bipartisan basis, Congressman uh, Liu, on developing a framework for facial recognition technology, how that is appropriate, what, what, what we hope is model legislation, frankly, working with some of the good folks on our panel, like Mr. Bedoya, uh, to develop that information. Understand the context. We learned that several federal agencies use Stingray technology to conduct surveillance on Americans without a probable cause warrant. During that hearing, we also learned that the IRS several times used that same technology without a probable cause warrant. The same IRS that targeted people for exercising their First Amendment liberties, targeted people for their political beliefs. That is the context we find ourselves in today. And now we have this system in all those states that the chairman just put up. This is a critical issue at, a, at the appropriate time. And so I, I just, again, wanted to thank the chairman. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses uh, today and um, appreciate this hearing and just how critical, um, critically important it is to Americans' First Amendment and Fourth Amendment liberties. With that, I yield back. You want to just give us the gist of it? I'd almost rather hear your your interpretation rather than hear them because uh, you're going to know you've got the BS filter. And we need the Lori okay. Anderson BS filter. So you just cover it as you see, you see fit, Lori. Go ahead. Okay. Give me just one second. Go ahead. Sounds good. Appreciate you all being with us tonight. This is, these are, this is the maiden voyage of Eric and Lori Anderson. Eric the Freedom Screamer, myself, and Lori Anderson. That's Lori with two R's. And we urge you to go online and check out Lori Anderson. That's L-O-R-R-I Anderson, Google+. Plus. And you can find Lori's work there and a lot of work. She's got a Courtroom Observers page. Um, she was a phenomenal writer and reporter. We really appreciate having Lori with us. And uh, we're going to get the technical difficulties worked out eventually, and we're going to be bigger and better every time we come on. So this is kind of fun. It's uh, the beginning stages of something I think that's going to be really good. Because uh, okay. I, don't hear, I don't hear the complete, I don't hear the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth coming from other broadcasts. I wish I did. I don't want to be the only guy out here really pushing the hard, but you know, pushing it. You know, I don't even hear uh, some of the other outfits covering these mainstream, this stuff that's kind of more or less in the in, out in the open in the mainstream. It's just, you know, let's see, we've got a group of people who, who are obviously leftists and communists, and they're overtly against what's going on with freedom and or the restoration of it. And then the people who are supposedly about freedom now, these new patriots in the administration, there's nothing nothing patriotic about them. They're trying, I mean, what's going on? We're head, running headlong into World War III. This is the exact same agenda that the Hillary Clinton administration would be executing if Hillary was president right now. So I don't see how we're any better off. We'd be, we, we'd be better off with Hillary in that people would see the atrocities that are going on and the warmongering and the, and the ridiculous comments I hear from other people. Well, Trump is sending a message. Use your telephone and send a text to send a message. You don't bomb a country and kill innocent people to send a message to somebody else. How would you like it if some nation like Russia or China or whoever bombed our country and said, oh, don't sweat it. It was just the leader of that country needed to send a message to somebody else. Oh, great. great. Okay, kill us for, for that. Oh, wonderful. Hey, you That's know, what we're Eric, doing. I, go ahead, Lori. Can you hear me? I was going to say, yes, you know, and, and we used that analogy the other night on RBN on the last night 
of the RBN show, and I know that's kind of off the facial recognition, what's going on, and we will get back on that in a second. But, you know, the, the justification of the chemical weapons um, and everybody who has any kind of common sense knows that this is a false flag attack. But um, yeah. even if you believe that Assad did it, Okay, this is this is the point that I made the other night. Even if you believe that Assad did it, that doesn't justify being able to go in and bomb the other country. Why? Right. Okay, let's use the example of 1993 in Waco when they used the chemical weapons in order to, for the incineraries in order for Waco, Texas, in order to be able to burn 76 people alive. I mean, it was men, women, and children, and so. Our government did that to its own civilians. So if you try to use that as a justification for bombing Syria, then in reality you're saying it would have been okay for another government to come in and bomb our government because they had done that to our people in 1993. So when you start really thinking about the type of situation in which they're using to justify it, whether he did or did not, and I personally, there, there, there is just... It, a false flag. There's no way Assad did that, but that's my personal thing. Even if he did, we still don't have a right uh, to go over there and bomb, and especially without congressional approval. That's an act of war. It's illegal, unlawful, and it was um, it was even against international law. There was even no no agreement in the international realm to be able to do that. So uh, the neocons got what they wanted. They helped ISIS. Uh, they helped the terrorists. Um, for a little bit, they have gained uh, support of the ones that they wanted to gain support of, which have been helping with the atrocities of the terrorists for a very long time. The neocons that, that don't want us to have a working relationship with Russia, and I don't mean being best buddy, 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 but I do mean you have to have a type of a working relationship in order to stay out of war. That's kind of common sense, and they did not want that. So what was the best way to do that? Well, with the bombing over there, you not only help the terrorists, you have the Russians who are, have been helping Assad get rid of these terrorists for a very long time, and these are terrorists. These are not Syrians. Most of them are sent in, whether it be by way of Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, the United States, the United Kingdom, you name it, they all have their hands in it. So with that being said, you cannot sit there and tell us that the reason that they did it was over um, uh, those that small amount of children that have died when by per our own drone attacks via the Obama administration. I'm not sure about the numbers under, um, I'm pre under President Trump, and I'm not sure about how many drone strikes have been done under President Trump, but I do know, you know, thousands upon thousands of children blown to smithereens by these drones attacks. Some of these were targeted specifically, and they were an American citizen, did not get a charge, uh, did not get charges, did not get a trial, which was justified just, oh, well, sorry, your dad was the wrong dad, so we're going to kill you as well. So the, the justification of it's because of the children is bull. You need to research the 2009, the, the pipeline. That's exactly what's going on. They have not allowed the world, those corrupt globalist bankers, to be inside of Syria. And um, they're not allowing them to take over their natural resources. Anywhere in the globe, if you go to Italy, um, ICLEI.org, and you go there, and they quit actually updating their mapping. But if you check out their global mapping, you will see everywhere that Italy is at is where there is not war. And everywhere that Italy is not at, that's where there's massive conflict. So it is part of the Agenda 21, 2030, yada, yada, and all of that good little stuff. But the, the irrelevance is Trump won a lot because he was saying, stay out of Syria. It is their business. And that's the truth. It is their business. Back in the day, a couple of years ago, Assad asked for the United States government's help, and they refused. The only thing that they helped with was arming, training, funding the terrorists that are over there killing the innocent people in the first place. So there is no justification for bombing of Syria. And all it did was place us in a bad light. And now, in all honesty, why should Russia even try to um, 
trust us when it comes to a treaty or talks or, or anything else, to be honest with you. Uh, the individuals that are close to Trump are very, uh, very uh, shady cats. I mean, you know, they say one thing, and but if you look into their history, they're very anti-Russian, Assad to be removed, and this, that, and the other. Who do they think they are? Um, I'm sorry, but the people of Syria are who decides rules Syria, not the American people, not the UK, not Saudi Arabia, not Israel, not anybody else. It is their government. It is their people. It is their business. It is not our business. If we want to make America great again, then what we need to do is we need to start worrying about America, getting our troops out of unlawful invasions, get their butts back home. And if you want to really protect the border, well, guess what? We've got plenty of troops that we can put right on the border and use that for the real national defense instead of instigating, starting, and invading, and helping to overthrow lawful, sovereign nations' governments. So on that note, um, Eric, if you want to say anything to that, that's fine. Otherwise, I will get back to the facial recognition because I believe this is something imperative for everybody to know. Yeah, you keep right on talking. I'm enjoying it. Go ahead, Lori. Okay, so... In the second part of Mr. Bedoya's um, testimony, the opening testimony, he says, and he is uh, from Georgetown Law, by the way, he says, why should you care about law enforcement face recognition? Historically, when law enforcement wanted to identify someone, they had to approach that person and ask for identification. Even when police identified someone using DNA or fingerprints, this was generally a targeted process where a single person was identified as part of an investigation and usually through an in-person or on-site interaction. Think of a police officer rolling a suspect's fingers across an ink pad or an investigator collecting a hair sample from a crime scene. Face recognition can be used in a similar way. An officer in the street may use a smartphone face recognition app to identify someone in the course of a field stop. A jail can use it to verify a detainee's identity from his mugshot. In its more advanced uses, however, face recognition lets law enforcement identify people from far away and in secret. It also lets them remotely identify large groups of people, not just the target of an investigation. Think of a telephoto lens being used to photograph and ID the people in a crowd or a surveillance camera that scans every face that is passing by. These tools will help law enforcement left unchecked. However, law enforcement face recognition creates profound questions about the future of our society. Should this technology be targeted at serious criminals and terrorists or should it be used to scan the face of anyone at any time? Should face recognition databases be limited to criminals, or should they include the faces of every man, woman, and teenager with a driver's license? Do you have the right to walk down the street without having your face scanned? In the past, Congress and the states have answered these kinds of questions through legislation. In the absence of any comprehensive federal or state statutes, or any court decisions for that matter. In most cases, the full extent of privacy and civil liberties protections depends on the policies voluntarily adopted by law enforcement agencies. Our investigation aim to identify those policies and evaluate their impact. Now, in his next part of his statement, he states, how does the FBI use face recognition? The FBI has devoted substantial resources to face recognition. FBI face recognition searches of state driver's license photos are almost six times more common than federal court ordered wiretaps. Think about that. The FBI has two primary roles with respect to face recognition. First, the FBI hosts a database of at least 24.9 million mugshots, the next generation identification interstate photo system, which is searchable by the FBI and a dozen state agencies. Second, the FBI is also an active user of the technology. Its Facial Analysis Comparison and Evaluation Services Unit, also known as FACE Services, runs a request criminal face recognition searches of a network of databases 
that together contain 411.9 million face photos. This network includes the Department of State visa photos and 16 state driver's license photos. Our research revealed that the FBI field offices in Florida can also conduct a face recognition searches of that state's driver's license photos, but these searches are not run through the FACE services. The Government Accountability Office found that from August of 2011 to December 2015, FACE services ran 36,420 searches of those 16 states' driver's photos. Those searches produced only 210 likely candidates for investigation. And yeah, you heard that right. Likely candidates for investigation. So what they're searching for, they're searching for quote unquote leads. They're using this for leads. This, so obviously there's no probable cause warrant. You can't do that without naming a name, naming the place to be searched, and the things that you are actually looking for. So obviously that right there shows you it's a complete violation of the fourth. The FBI is in a unique position to influence how law enforcement uses face recognition and ensure that people, that police departments adopt protections for privacy, civil liberties, and civil rights. It can model best practices to be adopted by the state and local police departments or condition access to its database. On agency adoption of those best practices as following, the selection shows this is an untapped opportunity. Okay, so I'm not going to the part with what is going on with this. It says, the face recognition is not targeted at criminals. It affects millions of law-abiding Americans. Since the ratification of the Fourth Amendment in 1791, Americans have agreed that law enforcement should not invade our privacy, absent a well-founded suspicion of criminal wrongdoing. As a result, law enforcement generally treats known and suspected criminals very differently from law-abiding people. Law enforcement uses the face, facial recognition, does not abide by that principle. It subjects millions of Americans to a powerful and error-prone surveillance technology. The facial recognition databases are not limited to criminals. Teenagers anxiously wait for the day when they will be old enough to go to the Department of Motor Vehicles, take a test, and stand for a photo, and then receive a learner's permit. What if every teen in America was then asked to submit their fingerprints for future criminal investigations by the FBI or the state police? Many people would be outraged. Yet our research shows that 29 states allow federal and state law enforcement to use face recognition technology to run or request searches of their driver's license faces, much like they would criminals' fingerprints. As of 2014, there were 125,392,814 licensed drivers aged 18 or older in those states. Based on the census figures, we can estimate that at least 51% of all American adults are in a criminal face recognition network. So, of course, it has grown. Um, in 2016, the criminal or forensic database, it says the FBI face recognition database is 84%. 16% of those are non-criminal. When you go to the FBI face recognition network, which is uh, face services of 2016, 80% of those photos collected are non-criminals. Twelve percent of them are unknown and then eight percent are criminals. The FBI fingerprint database, also disturbing, forty-one percent non-criminals. Think about that. Forty-one percent fingerprint database, non-criminals. The vast majority of these people have no idea that this is happening and we're not aware of any effort in these states to actually notify drivers that their faces will be searched as part of criminal investigations. In fact, 29 of the states, only two have laws that formally authorize law enforcement face recognition scans of their driver's license photos. In most others, law enforcement appears to rely on readings of driver's privacy laws. 
that were written before the advent of face recognition. Now I want to also note that in this hearing, it also was exposing the biometrics, the stingray, license plate readers, and all of that being worked together. So even if you think, oh, well, you know, I have nothing to hide, so I don't care what they have. Yeah, well, there's a lot of innocent people who've been set up because they have nothing to hide and they thought that people would be honest. And I'm not trying to be mean, but it's not their business. It's not the point that you have something to hide. It's the point that you have a right to privacy and they don't have a right to any of your information unless they get a search warrant and there better be probable cause with that. So, as the figure in previous page shows, law enforcement biometric databases have been typically populated exclusively or primarily by criminal or forensic samples. FBI's National DNA Index System, or NDIS, is almost exclusively composed of DNA profiles related to criminal arrest or forensic investigations. Over time, the FBI's fingerprint database has come to include non-criminal records. Now, let me ask you a quick question here including the fingerprints of immigrants and civil servants. So let me ask you a question, because you have some states, um, if you're a Second Amendment supporter, and those states and, and you're pro for that um, concealed carry permit in that state requires a fingerprint, guess who has it? Well, it's supposed to be unlawful for them to create that database. You don't think they have it? They do. The FBI face um, services bucks the trend by searching 16 states driver's license database photos from visa applications and Americans passport photos the FBI has created a network of databases that is overwhelmingly made up of non-criminal entries this is unprecedented and never before has law enforcement created a national biometric database or network of databases that is primarily made up of law-abiding people so they couldn't get that list in one way, so they're backdooring it and doing it in a different way. <sighs> okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm not going to read the rest of that. I have provided, by the way, um, on the broadcaster the links to where I'm getting this information from so you can get it as well. I'm trying to get the... GAO report up because that was really um, past the point of disturbing. I will also read to you if you want. This is what is called the M MOU, uh, the Memorandum of Understanding. This is what the agreement is between the feds and the states that are that are engaged in this. And I will pull up and give you the list of states so that you can call your representatives, your congressmen, and throw fit. <laughs> Uh, because they did this without the people knowing. And um, Mr. Mitchell, one of the representatives that was in um, in the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, he really nailed it uh, with his testimony. And I will be uploading that on my YouTube as well. Okay, so the Memorandum of Understanding between the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Criminal Justice Information Services Division, and the Alabama Department of Public Safety. So yes, this one covers Alabama. Concerning the search of Prova photos against the Alabama Department of Public Safety photo repository. Purpose. The purpose of this memorandum of understanding is to document the agreed responsibilities and functions of the parties with respect to conducting searches of the Alabama Department of Public Safety, which is DPS, facial recognition photo repository, which contains driver's license photos. These searches will be performed for the purpose of comparing the FBI Facial Analysis Comparison and Evaluation Services Unit probe photos against photos housed in the AL DPS's FR photo repository and obtaining information that will advance active FBI investigations, apprehend wanted fugitives or known or appropriately suspected terrorists, and locate missing persons nationwide. The probe photo refers to the photo of the subject of an active FBI investigation. Well, that right there is not quite so true because that is exposed in the 
in the hearing that is submitted for search against a photo repository. The anticipated result of that search will be a photo gallery of potential matches candidates. These potential matches will be forwarded to the FBI along with any associated information, which means address, phone numbers, fingerprints, anything they have on you. Um, with the photo in the AL DPS FR system, the FBI Face Services Unit will then perform comparisons to the candidates' photos against the probe photos to determine their value as an investigative lead. So they're doing all of this. They're violating our rights. They're, they're gathering our photos. They're, they're getting our biometrics for an investigative lead. Yeah. Something has really gone wrong because usually when you have an investigative lead, you will have an idea of whom, whom or at least something that you are looking for not just search a database of over 400 million images and innocent people without a warrant in the hopes that you can get a lead. The FBI Amazing. criminal, yeah. So it says the parties, the FBI Criminal Justice Information Services Division, Biometric Services Section, Face Services Unit provides investigative support to FBI field offices and headquarters divisions. The CJIS division through its assistant director is the FBI's point of contact for this MOU. For certain day-to-day -day operations of the activities described by this MOU, the FBI's POC with, all, with AL DPS will be the Face Services Unit Management and its management and program analysis analysts. The LDPS mission is to protect and serve Alabama's residents, of course, equally and objectively enforce state laws and uphold the constitutions of the United States and state of Alabama. Well, they've already violated that, have they not? They violated that in this agreement. So when you get to reading through these agreements, you realize that it's basically what they can do is they can take and let's say that um, a short lady with brown hair um, had robbed a grocery store. Okay, and so and that person was approximately in her forties. So they type that in. And it will search that criteria across the nation. And it will come up with a certain amount of top listed photos. And with the research that the Georgetown um, Law, uh, EFF, and um, the Government Accountability Office as well, it's showing that it's not quite so accurate. It's more discriminatory, even though it's an algorithm, and an algorithm in and, of, in and of itself cannot discriminate against a person because it's just it's triggered that way. It's an algorithm, but it misidentifies women and uh, black individuals much more so than it does white males. So that is also a concern. So let me tell you the documents that I am seeing that are related, here are the states, Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, Delaware, Illinois, Iowa, Kentucky, Maryland, Michigan, Nebraska, New Mexico, North Carolina, North Dakota, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, and Vermont. They have MOUs with the FBI to collect your data. Now, if you remember, um, because we have covered a lot of the protests and stuff that have been going on, um, and, and we've been trying to keep everybody up to date with what's been going on in Nevada with the Bundys um, and with the other individuals who are involved with that, if you remember at any protest, and it's not just their protest, I mean any protest, habitually you will see police officers these days come right up to you, even people who are exercising their First Amendment right to take pictures. And they're taking pictures and then they won't, they won't tell anyone 
what they're doing. They're just they just simply say I'm exercising my First Amendment right. And so the police officers, you'll see them have these cell phones, and they'll put it right up to your face, pretty close to your face, and take a picture. That's why they're entering in into that facial recognition system database trying to find out who you are because you're refusing to tell them who you are, which is your right. By the way, a neat little trick is if you contort your face in a strange shape, that will throw off their uh, readings dramatically. Right. So if you didn't um, get that, I'll list the states one more time just in case you're in one of these states. It's Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, Delaware, Illinois, Iowa, Kentucky, Maryland, Michigan, Nebraska, New Mexico, North Carolina, North Dakota, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and Utah. That was really disturbing. Now, the EFF, what the EFF has said about it, the EFF said this. Since my 2012 testimony on face recognition before the Senate Subcommittee on Privacy, and this is Ms. Lynch, by the way, from the EFF, um, Subcommittee on Privacy, Technology, and the Law, face recognition technology has advanced significantly. Now law enforcement officers can use mobile devices to capture face recognition ready photographs of people that they stop on the street, surveillance cameras, boost real-time face scanning, and identification capabilities, and the FBI has access to hundreds of millions of face recognition images of law-abiding Americans. However, the adoption of face recognition technologies like these has occurred without meaningful oversight, without proper accuracy, testing of the systems as they are actually used in the field, and without the enactment of legal protections to prevent their misuse. This has led to the development of unproven inaccurate systems that will impinge on constitutional rights and disproportionately impact people of color. The FBI's Interstate Photo System and Face Services Unit exemplify these problems. The minimal testing conducted by the Bureau showed that the IPS was incapable of accurate identification at least 15% of the time. This has a real world impact an inaccurate system will implicate people for crimes that they didn't commit, forcing them to try to prove their innocence and shifting the traditional burden of proof away from the government. This threat will likely disproportionately impact people of color. Face recognition misidentifies African Americans and ethnic minorities, young people and women, at a higher rate than whites, older people, and men, respectively. Due to years of well-documented racially biased police practices, all criminal databases, including mugshot databases, include a disproportionate number of African Americans, Latinos, and immigrants. These two facts mean that people of color will likely shoulder exponentially more of the burden of the interstate photo systems inaccuracies than whites. Despite these known challenges, the FBI has for years also failed to be transparent about its use of face recognition technology. It took seven years to update its privacy impact assessment for the IPS and didn't release one until a year after its system was fully operational. And the public had no idea how many images were accessible to its face services unit until last year's scathing Government Accountability Office report revealed that the Bureau could access nearly 412 million images, most of which were taken for non-criminal reasons like obtaining a driver's license or a passport. Without transparency, accountability, and proper security protocols in place, face recognition systems, like many other searchable databases of information available to law enforcement, may be subject to misuse. This misuse has already occurred on other contexts. For example, in 2010, Immigration and Customs Enforcement enlisted local police officers to use license plate readers to gather information about gun show customers. In Florida in 2011, more than 100 officers accessed driver and vehicle information for a female Florida state trooper after she was pulled over, after, excuse me, after she pulled over a Miami police officer for speeding. And a state audit that same year of law enforcement access to driver's information in Minnesota revealed 
half of all law enforcement personnel in Minnesota had misused driving records. Americans should not be forced to submit to criminal face recognition searches merely because they want to drive a car. They shouldn't have to worry that their data will be misused by an unethical government officials with unchecked access to face recognition databases. And they shouldn't have to fear that their every move will be tracked as if <clears throat> will be tracked if face recognition is linked to the networks of surveillance cameras that blanket many cities. But without meaningful pro legal protections, this is where we may be headed. Without laws in place, it could be relatively easy for the government and private companies to amass databases of images of all Americans and use those databases to identify and track people in real time as they move from place to place throughout their daily lives. As researchers at Georgetown discovered last year, one out of two Americans is already in the face recognition database accessible to law enforcement. As this committee noted in its excellent 2016 report on law enforcement use of cell site simulators, um, that is also um, another issue that is talked about. Advances in emerging surveillance technologies like face recognition require careful evaluation to ensure their use is consistent with the prote protections afforded under the First and Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and just as with the cell site simulators, transparency and accountability are critical to ensure that face recognition use not only comports with constitutional protections but preserves democratic values. Justice, Justice Alto noted that noted in his concurring opinion in the United States v. Jones the circumstances involving dramatic technological change, the best solution to privacy concerns may be legislative. Just as this committee found with cell site simulators, also known as Stingray everyone, the use of the face recognition must be limited. I urge the committee to introduce legislation to do just that. So that is her opening statement and um, she goes much more in detail in her testimony and, and especially in the question and answer and if you get over to the site that I created a link for you for at the actual site uh, the really good questioning when the when the FBI agent twisted and manipulated what was said she does a really good job at exposing that FBI agent for just what she was you know some people say she misinformed them. No, she 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 was uh, sugarcoating it. You know, omission is the same thing. So uh, you can start at that if you want to write it down. Starts at 51 minutes and 48 seconds, and you can go to um, one hour and one minute and 27 seconds for just that one specific section that I'm talking about. So if you've noticed, though, over and over and over, they keep saying, we need to put protections in, we need to have policy, we need to have this because it said we don't have any kind of protection for that's written up to control this. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And it's our unalienable right to privacy. Uh, which was confirmed, of course, in the Fourth Amendment, in the Bill of Rights. So, I would really appreciate it. I'm telling you, this is going to be one of the most important hearings that you will ever, ever um, listen to. And I would suggest you surely um, listen to it. I wish that I could play it for you. Maybe I'll get it to the get to the ability where I can. But I can tell you um, what the Government Accountability Office found. The Government Accountability Office report says the GAO found that the Department of Justice Federal Bureau of Investigation operates next generation identification interstate photo system 
a facial recognition service that allows law enforcement agencies to search a database of over 30 million photos to support criminal investigations. NGIIPS users include the FBI and selected state and local law enforcement agencies, which can submit search requests to help identify an unknown person using, for example, a photo from a surveillance camera. When a state or local agency submits such a photo, NGIIPS uses an automated process to return a list of 2 to 50 possible candidate photos from the database, depending on the user's specification. As of December 2015, the FBI had agreement, has agreements with seven states to search NGIIPS and is working with more states to grant access, which of course now is much more. In addition to NGI IPS, the FBI has an internal unit called the Facial Analysis Comparison and Evaluation, otherwise known as FACE, F-A-C-E services that provides face recognition capabilities, among other things to support active FBI investigations. The FACE services not only has access to the NGI IPS, but can search or request to search databases owned by the Department of State and defense and 16 states, which use their own facial recognition systems. Biometric, and that biometric analysis manually review photos before returning at most of the top one or two photos as an investigative leave to the FBI agents. The Department of Justice developed a privacy impact assessment known as a PIA of NGI IPS in 2008. As required under the federal, under the e-government act, whenever agencies develop technologies that collect personal information, however, the FBI did not update the NGI IPS PIA in a timely manner when the system underwent significant changes, nor published a PIA for FACE services before that unit began supporting FBI agents. Department of Justice ultimately approved the PIAs for NGI IPS and FACE services in September and May of 2015, respectively. The timely publishing of PIAs would provide the public with greater assurance that the FBI is evaluating risks to privacy when implementing systems. Similarly, NGI IPS has been in place since 2011, but the Department of Justice did not publish a system of records notice or SORN that addresses the FBI's use of face recognition capabilities as required by law until May the 5th of 2016 after the completion of the GAO's review. The timely publishing of a SORN would improve the public's understanding of how NGI uses and protects personal information. So right there, the FBI, it's, it's in the Government Accountability Office's own review, they broke the law. They didn't release the information to you or I or to anyone, and the only reason they, they decided to do it then was because the Government Accountability Office's review came out. Prior to deploying... In GIIPS, the FBI conducted limited testing to evaluate whether face recognition surface searches returned matches to persons in the database. The detection rate within a candidate list of 50, but is not assessed how often the errors occur. FBI officials stated that they do not know, and they have not tested, the detection rate for candidate lists size smaller than 50, which users sometimes request from the FBI. By conducting tests to verify that NGI IPS is accurate for all allowable candidate list size, the FBI would have more reasonable assurance that NGI IPS provides leads that help enhance rather than hinder criminal investigations. Additionally, the FBI has not taken steps to determine whether the face recognition systems used by external partners, such as states and federal agencies, are sufficiently accurate for the use of face services to support FBI investigations. By taking such steps, the FBI could better ensure the data received from external partners 
and is sufficiently accurate and do not unnecessarily include photos of innocent people as investigative leads. So this is the type of stuff that the media is not telling you. And this was March 22nd. I will have every bit of this available on my Google Plus because I keep everything updated on the Google Plus so that you can follow the links. You can find it on the Google Plus site. I will even post the Google Plus um, the links in uh, to the actual documents themselves as well for the reports. If you would like to obtain them, you can download them as well. This is coming from the actual source, everyone. I am not um, getting this from an article. I'm getting this from their actual reports. So another thing that really bothered me other than without a warrant and I kept on hearing, um, well, it was just, it's, it's Eric, this is driving me crazy. It's just to obtain an investigative lead. Well, you know, it's just to, you know, wow, Lord, where have we, where have we gone? It, I mean, it's really getting to the point where you have to be sick in the head to work for government. It's just so far beyond. It's, 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 but, you know, and this is why we're here, though. We're trying to do our part to bring the word to everybody out there. Once again, you're listening to the radio call with Eric the Freedom Screamer and Lori Anderson. That's L-O-R-R-I, Lori with two R's, last name Anderson. You can find her stuff on her Google Plus account. She has a great setup there. And, of course, we also have courtroomwatch.com. That's courtroomwatch.com. Stay apprised of all with everything that's going on, especially the jury nullification message. That's the most important thing that we can get the message out there. Uh, so people download the jury nullification flyer and pass that out to as many people as possible. And follow Lori Anderson on her Google Plus account. Back to you, Lori. Uh, 